Welcome to another set of tips and tricks. And today we're going flashback, man. We're going to go back in history, and we're going to talk a little bit about the, some of the inventions and some of the creative ideas that companies and individuals had over the last 40, 50, 60 years that has paved the way for our modern inventions, our modern bass boats, the technologies we use today and how those guys became creative so that they could catch more fish, just like the companies today are still creating new ideas to catch fish. We're going to talk about the old Minn Kota trolling motors, the, the super skeeter and the skeeter's history of being the first in bass boats, and we're going to get into the talking about hummingbird. So let's get started and, and flash back to about 1948. Here's where it all began. Holmes Thurman had a better idea for a better way to fish and catch fish. Down in uh, the Shreveport, Louisiana area uh, of East Texas, Western Louisiana, they had a lot of cypress bayous and you can see in some of these pictures uh, the terrain that they were fishing. And the canoe wasn't very stable and the John boat wasn't very stable. So Holmes Thurman had this great idea of bringing us our first bass boat. It was a wooden boat. Uh, one of the unique characteristics was it was very wide and stable. And we'll zoom in here and show you some of these pictures. But in 1948, the first bass boat was a Skeeter bass boat. This year they're celebrating their 65th anniversary of bringing bass boats to fishermen across the country. We're over here at the Skeeter Wall of Fame, as I call it. This is 1948 is when it all began and still today Skeeter Bass Boats is bringing innovation, engineering unlike any other boat. And Holmes Thurman back in 1948 with the original first Skeeter that had that long nosed beak, uh, a nice wide sides, changed the way fishing would be done forever. He invented the first bass boat. One of the things that he wanted was they hunted and fished these, these shallow bayous. They needed something to draft it shallow, something that was very stable. So Holmes came up with this idea of the first Skeeter and making that wider footprint so that the boat was very stable. And that's where it all began. Bass boats started with Skeeter. And let's just take a, take a glance from the first ones in 1948 and we'll move down through some of the the interesting features to the history of Skeeter Bass Boats. 1948, the birth of the bass boat. You can see the original Skeeter Bass Boat there. There's those Cypress Bayous like Holmes and all those people in uh, East Texas, Western Louisiana was fishing. Great fishing spots, big bass busting places, but they needed something that was stable that they could uh, go out there and fish and be safe. And that's where the first bass boat was invented to make it safer to fish, easier to, easier to fish, and to get back in these big bass busting places. Into the 1950s, Skeeter kept that tradition, and then in the 60s, we saw the first fiberglass bass boat and actually 1961 Skeeter brought the first fiberglass bass boat to the market. And that's where our super Skeeter like we've got behind us originated. After the 1960s is where it really starts getting exciting. In the 1970s, you can see Skeeter took the Super Skeeter and started adding new models. Uh, we got the more V-pad configurations started started building in. We started getting more of the modern look and feel of the bass boat. Fiberglass was big. Uh, they had a little boat called the Odyssey. Uh, the Skeeter Wrangler started coming in in 1976. Um, the first V-pad hull was in 1975. Um, the first bass boat rated for a 150 came in our 1970s era. 
uh, Skeeter had a lot of firsts. And the history and the innovation built off of that first Skeeter bass boat continued. And let's go through and look at the 70s and the 80s and see how that bass boat evolved into what we have today. You can see in the 1970s, we started getting a traditional more fiberglass bass boat like we have today. We had the Eagle. The little Odyssey. That had to have been a little fun boat to drive. But the Skeeter, Skeeter boats moved to Kilgore, Texas in the 70s. The same place, the home of it today. Had the first V bottom bass boat in 75. In 76, the Skeeter Wrangler was, in, was added to the line. Where 150 horsepower outboards came into existence. The SX series came in the 1970s. And then we get into the 1980s. The first patented hull of the Starfire. The center console bass boat. Skeeter had the first center console. Right down there. There's still some of them running around. After we get into the 80s, the 1990s really started changing the thing. We started worrying about fuel efficiency and safety and the story and the legends of the sport. Old Harold Allen, Gary Klein, Rick Klun, some of the biggest names in the sports started with Skeeter, ran Skeeters. Why? Because they had a they had a V series that that ran fast, got them to the fishing location. These guys knew fishing, and Skeeter knew bass boats. In the in the 1990s, we started seeing the first deep V multi species boats come from Skeeter. And the introduction in '94 of the the bay boats, offshore coastal boats came from Skeeter, still building them today. And then Skeeter was the first to use a composite. Yes, the ZX series with the 202C was one of the first boats. We've seen the ver reverse draft sponsons. We've seen uh, the strongest transom in the industry come from Skeeter. And it kept growing and kept growing. In the 2000s, Skeeter introduced the I-Class. And the first 20-footer with a two, 250, yes, that was a Skeeter first. And in 2008, Skeeter celebrated their 60th anniversary. And today, Skeeter celebrates number 65, longest-running bass boat of any company. 1967. This boat is older than the second oldest bass boat in the country. This bad boy is going to turn 46 years old today, and it's in pristine condition just like she was. But she had a rough life. Uh, I know the whole history of it. It was sold to an oil man in the Longview, Texas area. Uh, from that area, it, it traveled to Kansas City, Missouri, where the nephew of the original owner gave it to me to bring it back to life. Here's the way that I picked up this Super Skeeter. And if you look, I tore the old floor out. Here's actually an old piece of the balsa wood that was in the floor. They were actually set in there like parquet tiles. This is the little history of uh, the family that gave me the boat and some of our history. And I've got to thank my good friends up at Shoreline Fiberglass. 46 years later, it's still water ready, still ready to go out there and catch bass. Um, she's kind of in a retirement home right now. I look over there and I look at the beauty of it and think, man, where have we come? When I parked my new 2013 FX20 here next to her, 
Um, it really makes me think, where did we start and where have we come from? Skeeter in the 67s, we had fiberglass. Uh, not long after that, you started seeing lights built into, uh, stick steering. Uh, the, the fast boat started getting pimped out. We started seeing some really cool features being added to bass boats to make them a total fishing package. This one was a, this one features an old Oliver motor from the back in the 50s. Yes, Oliver farm equipment had uh, outboard motors. And this one's featuring one of those on it. Let's just take a gander and, and look at the, the differences of today's bass boats versus the bass boats where it all started. We had rod holders, had swivel seats. Man, those suckers, not as comfortable as what we had, but I bet they were nice in their days. Look at the Skeeter with the nice wide flare here. Uh, still a feature of, of today, and that Skeeter nose, that pointed nose to help cut that water and keep the spray off you and make it more comfortable when you're out there fishing. And we get back here, the Super Skeeter. Look at the nice wide transom we had. Nice and flat. The sides flared out here, make it stable. When this, when this side would go down, it would help flatten out the boat. Had our running, running strakes down here, our Oliver outboard. 15 horsepower. I bet you thought you could conquer the world. People said, where's that? That guy's going to fish the whole lake. The first thing we needed once we got bass boats was how deep was it? How were we going to tell depth? And that's where a lot of creative ideas over the years have came. If we look at our first depth finder, it was simply nothing but a weight. Typically it was a window weight on a string, they'd drag that along, they'd come to a hump, they'd come up to a hump, and the line would go in. That's how they told depth. When it was when it was tight, it was deep. When it hit a hump or a point, the line would slacken up, and they that's how they found our first structure. Then we get into hummingbird. Hummingbird started their first thing that they ever did was heat kit. Made in a little box that our depth finder came in. We had a flasher, heat kit, made all kinds of different kits, and, but you had to assemble them. So what Hummingbird actually, where they actually started was assembling these heat kits. If you look in here, you've got our transducer, you had our transducer, you had your flasher, and what they actually did was you would put this in a boat. We have our transom mount bracket with double suction cups, and you would stick that on the back of the boat, and this would be a tie for safety. And then you could start telling depth. And if you watch the blips in between, you would actually start seeing fish. That was back in 1971. Hummingbird started doing that. Then, in about 1975, the company really grabbed the attention by making the first waterproof sounder. The Super 60. And that's where the Hummingbird brand actually started. The reason they call it Hummingbird was because when these things would run, they would actually make a humming sound. And that's where Hummingbird started, was mm, of that of that flasher. The next thing we came into was the paper graph. You had basically a stylus. The paper would roll. The stylus would, would print the sonar data on off onto a piece of paper. And you would be able to see it. The big thing was you'd run out of paper. The styluses would break. And it was hard to... It was a lot of maintenance while you're on the water. And then in 1984, Hummingbird revolutionized the industry 
by bringing the first LCR liquid crystal readout display to fish finders. Here's the LCR 2000, which was one of those first that came to the market from Humminbird. In 1987, Humminbird had the number one fish finder that's ever been sold, the LCR 4ID. Minn Kota. Man, they've had a rich history. It's kind of an interesting story of how Minn Kota got its start. Uh, Sam Johnson, which owned, was a son of, S, of the Johnson Wax Company, uh, we were going through the depressions in the thir late 30s, early 40s, and he, he knew that if people would get out and enjoy the outdoors, that they wouldn't be as worried about what the economy was doing. It was a good, vibrant way to pass your time and enjoy, enjoy the outdoors. He, so he was in search of outdoor companies, and there was a company called Johnson Reels that he was very interested in. And as part of that acquisition, that I, this is a story that I've been told, that this guy was working on an electric motor uh, to propel boats. So as part of his decision in buying that Johnson Real brand, he wound up acquiring Minn Kota Trolling Motors. And the, the story that I've heard, it was like a dollar that he bought this company because it hadn't been perfected collection with the CDR 121. This is kind of an interesting motor because if you look the the flexible prop shaft was actually curved here. It, they had a flexible shaft to drive the motor from the motor head up here. You actually had verbal speed control. You could turn the handle and get different speeds. One, two, three, three different speeds. You could turn the trolling motor. This was a transom mount. You could drive that thing around the lake and you could slow down and catch fish and move with this and it was quiet and stealthy. Uh, next motor we're going to talk about is the HGR. This motor came out in the late 1960s. It was a variable speed. You had a variable speed knob on the back here that you could control the speeds of the motor. Still a very similar head design, but one of the unique things of this motor, if we look at it, we had a straight shaft with a 90 degree gearbox. We actually have a little lower unit down here that ran the prop on the HGR. Also in the late 1960s, we started seeing the, the, the UWJR. This is a, another motor, but you notice we moved our head and our windings down to the lower unit down here. This was also a variable speed motor that you could control the speeds from the end switch and you could steer from the transom. This is uh, just a few pieces that I've uh, acquired over time but man look at the, think of the innovations if we didn't have trolling motors, if we didn't have fish finders, if Holmes Thurman wouldn't have thought about creating the first bass boat. Outboard motors. This has all evolved into time. I mean, we've got 250 horsepower Yamaha shows pushing 20, 20 21, 22 foot bass boats with the latest side imaging, trolling motors that are GPS assisted like our new iPilot with the link here. We can actually follow contours. Uh, we've got Talon shallow water anchors. The bass boat and fishing in general has evolved. And it's interesting where we got our start. And I hope you enjoyed this little segment. Isn't it an, isn't it an interesting flashback from our Humminbird Electronics to the Super Skeeter Boat, to the history of Skeeter Bass Boats, to Minn Kota Trolling Motors? We've had a very, very, very rich history and fishing. And, it, and it's only getting better. I mean, with our technologies, we've got trolling motors now that, like the iPilot on the Trovo, they can use GPS to guide itself. We can follow mapping contours on our Lake Master map. We've got electronics like side imaging, down imaging, 
and new for 2013 is 360 imaging. It's just hitting the water right now, and people are going to be able to look into the future. Look forward of them. See where that structure is out to the side of them without moving the boat or moving the transducer to create picture-like images of the underwater world. From that old dragging that bell anchor around or that window weight, isn't it interesting where we've come from and where we've gone to? The Skeeter Bass Boats, my 2013 is on its way. It's getting built right now, and I'm excited to get in it. But thinking about what it would have been like to have to fish out of the old 1967 Super Skeeter here, 46 years old. It's older than any other bass boat company that's in existence today. I mean, 65 years of Skeeter tradition. And I'm going to get to partake in that. This, that's going to be my 13th Skeeter new that I've ordered. This is number 14. I've had a 1969 that I've restored that was pimped out a little bit more. It's down in Alabama enjoying a nice life of retirement down there on a big bass lake. I know it's already had a 10-pounder caught out of it. But isn't it interesting to see what our, the generations before us, what they had to go through and what they used to become successful fishermen. It's the same thing we've got today, but our technology is more involved, making it easier for us. So I hope you enjoyed this little segment of tips and tricks. And tune in next time as we go more in depth about products in the fishing industry and how to get the most out of them. And hopefully that you'll invest in that same technology so you can enjoy your time on the water. Because catching is a heck of a lot better than casting. Thank you and tune in next time.